can I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and particularly can I thank Perry Wandon, the Wurundjeri elder, for his welcome to country. And uh, can I also pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd like to acknowledge Mary Wildridge, the Minister of Community Services, Minister of Mental Health, Minister of Disability Services and Reform. Julie Rudman uh, from the Roundtree Foundation. Uh, Andrew Jackamos, the Commissioner for Aboriginal Children and Young People. Uh, Kate Jenkins, the Commissioner for Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commissioner. Jill Callister, Secretary of the Department of Human Services. And Michaela Cronin, VCOS President and uh, CEO of McKillop Family Services. Emma King and her staff at VCOS who do such a great job for VCOS. But I acknowledge the board members of VCOS who, in addition to their day-to-day -day roles, provide that voluntary leadership of VCOS, which is so important and so vital. And also the many representatives of our really hard-working community sector across the state. I'm very pleased to be here to open the 2014 VCOS Summit setting the agenda. We in Victoria can be very, very proud of our Victorian social and community services sector, at what makes Victoria a great community. Uh, the professionals, and I'm also pleased to acknowledge the volunteers who make a real difference for people and families across the state. These are the people who make our towns, our cities, our suburbs into real communities. It is the people who uh, work to assist people in need, whether it's somebody who's had a recent bereavement, who bring the casseroles to the front door, whether it's the people who deliver the meals on wheels, or the people in more structured organisations who assist uh, people with disabilities, assist people in, who are elderly, assist those special needs, people with special needs. That's what makes a Victoria a great community, and that's what we can be very, very proud of. And VCOS and its organisation provide a structure and support and direction for many of those organisations which harness both professionals and volunteers to deliver those services. And Michaela, in her introduction, talked a bit about uh, my personal circumstance, and, and I was very proud to be Minister for Community Services and Youth in the last century now, in the late 90s. And um, certainly it was uh, something that I really enjoyed doing, and uh, it is a challenging role, but an important role. But I also think about my own broader family, and I don't do it in a sense of uh, trying to uh, create that special connection, but to say that every family, when they look at their own family in Victoria, irrespective of their circumstances, have situations where uh, they have connections to our broader community uh, services, and the needs of the community. Um, my mum, who was uh, a terrific mum, mum of 10 kids and a great leader in the Winchelsea community, established the local Winchelsea Star newspaper and she claims that she was one of the leaders of the neighbourhood house movement with the uh, development of uh, neighbourhood house in Winchelsea, where I think it was one of the first who ever established. And, and she was also very actively involved in the community. But for the last 10 years she suffered severely from Alzheimer's disease and so she's now in care herself. Uh, I've had uh, involvement with disability services as foster parents and a whole range of other services. So we just see ourselves as an ordinary family in the community doing the things that we do. But each and every ordinary family in the community has that connection and that need to be involved in the social service and the community services sector. And I think that's really important to note. It's, it's not some families, it's every family in the state. Every family has that connection to the community services sector. And I think that's really why we believe that VCOS is so important, your organisations are so important, and our uh, shared vision for Victoria is so important. And we do have a vision as a coalition government, uh, which we believe many people in this room would share. That is, for all Victorians to be able to live as independently as possible, to enjoy the best po possible quality of life they can, as well as those people being given the opportunity to make a social and economic contribution to our community and our great state. And we believe that having a strong economy provides the best possible basis for delivering those sort of outcomes. That a strong economy does provide the jobs for those who want and need a job to work. Having a strong economy also delivers the funding we need to provide the essential services 
in health, education, public transport and community safety that we need to have a strong and vibrant community. And it also creates the capacity to provide uh, cost of living savings at appropriate times and places for those in need and having the economic capacity to be able to deliver those special services that we need to deliver and we want to deliver to people who in special needs. And I think when one looks around the world that it is economies that are stronger are best place to look after the most vulnerable in the community. The challenge is, is to make sure we have a community that recognises that you need to have a strong economy and you need to have the compassion and the caring to use that economy to deliver the best outcomes for the world. And uh, so that's why in this year's budget we we're pleased to be able to deliver a AAA rated budget with surpluses now and into the future. Because that gives us the capacity as a government to deliver in this year's budget a $14.9 billion record funding for health, a record funding for school education this year and in 2015, uh, significant funding for community safety and for community services. We also are able to invest money in key infrastructure that improves the quality of life of Victorians but also improves the economic opportunities for business in this state so that business can grow and develop and create jobs. And that key infrastructure in itself will create 26,000 new jobs. And we welcome the comments from VCOS on the uh, announcement of the budget where they uh, supported uh, our decision to create infrastructure and create the 26,000 jobs. And indeed, since we've been in government, there is now over 55,000 more Victorians in employment now than when we came to government three years ago. And particularly in region and rural Victoria, we as a state are growing uh, jobs faster in region and rural Victoria than any other state or territory. And we think that's important because as a government, we want Melbourne to retain itself as the most livable city in the world. So we support population growth in Melbourne, but we want population to grow faster in regional and rural cities to help decentralise our population and our economic uh, uh, strengths so that we can have a state of cities rather than a city-state. Part of the budget was also about providing uh, funding that we need for uh, children and early children, childhood development. So in our uh, funding for schools, we particularly emphasised uh, $273 million for students with disabilities and special funding for additional bus services for students with disabilities. And in vocational education and training, which is a vital area for young people, and it's interesting to note that in, in terms of youth, we are pleased in Victoria that the youth employment ratio, the youth employment ratio is 4%. Youth unemployment ratio is 4%. And the ratio, which is different to the normal stats we see for youth unemployment, the youth employment ratio takes every young person between 18 and 25, of which the vast majority are in education, and says how many of those are actually unemployed. And it's 4% in Victoria, which is the lowest in Australia. And that's because we do have a strong education system with one of the best retention rates to year 12 and a strong vocational education and training system. And this year we've allocated $1.2 billion for education and training. And indeed this year, or in 2013, I'm sorry, there are 645,000 people enrolled in uh, government subsidised education and training and that's 51% more than there were three years ago in 2012. And indeed, in terms of the most vulnerable people in our community, enrolment of unemployed people is up 116%, Indigenous people is up 35%, people with a disability is up 49%, and people from culturally and linguistic backgrounds is up 95%. And I'm particularly pleased that the courses that are being undertaken have shifted significantly uh, to now we're running at 70% of the courses being undertaken being courses directly related to job opportunities and job vacancies in the community rather than 49% three years ago. As I said at the outset, 
we see one of the reasons that you have a strong economy is so you can make strategic decisions to reduce the cost of living for ordinary Victorians. And one of the key areas is in concessions. So this year we've allocated over $500 million for concessions. You may have heard uh, recently that the federal budget, uh, which was a week later than our budget, announced a reduction in the National Partnership for Concessions. That will have an immediate impact on Victoria. So that impact on Victoria as of 1 July this year, we will have $75 million that we used to get from the federal government will no longer be uh, coming to Victoria. Uh, we've made a decision as a government that we will not allow Victorians who are eligible for concessions to miss out because of that federal government decision. So I'm pleased to reaffirm today here at this uh, VCOS summit that we as a government are committed to fully funding the concessions for all Victorian eligible concession card holders. So that's concessions on electricity, gas, municipal rates and water concessions and public transport concessions will be fully funded by the Victorian government. We will pick up the $75 million shortfall uh, by the federal government decision because we will not see Victorian concession card holders miss out. Now that can only be done because we have a budget surplus and a strong budget position. Other states and territories may be in a more challenging situation. The other things that we have done with respect to concessions is we've extended the electricity concession for Victorian concession card holders from the winter energy concession, which was a six month concession, to a 12 month year round concession. That means for every month of the year, people who are eligible for the electricity concession get a concession under this government. And it's interesting to note that in the 20 years uh, that I've been in politics, we've shifted. When our peak demand from electricity used to always be in July and August, in the coldest months of the year, now our peak demand for electricity is now in January and February in the warmest months of the year. So it's absolutely appropriate for the most vulnerable families, the most vulnerable people in our community, that they have eligibility for concessions when their bills are highest in the summer months. We've also delivered a 50% reduction for ambulance subscription fees for all Victorian families. We've reformed the fire services levy, which was a levy on uh, property, uh, for levy on insurance policies, and we've moved it to a property-based levy in line with the recommendations of the Bushfire Royal Commission. That is a fairer, more equitable system. But it also means that everybody pays their fair share. So for most Victorian families, that delivered a significant saving. And in this year's announcement, we've been able to even deliver further savings to most Victorian families. And also we introduced, uh, when we changed to the property-based system, for the first time, a $50 concession for eligible concession card holders. And in this year's budget, uh, we announced from the 1st of January next year that if you live in Zone 2 in the Melbourne metropolitan area or you travel from Zone 2 to Zone 1, you'll be able to do it for a Zone 1 fare. And that will provide an enormous saving for people who live in the outer suburbs of Melbourne, particularly those travelling regularly to work. And trams will be free in the CBD and Docklands. Again, making public transport more affordable and more available to more people. And recently we announced that uh, all Melbourneian households will receive a $100 saving on their water bills starting from the 1st of July. And uh, that's through efficiencies and better management of our water authorities. And those savings of uh, not quite, well whether $100 or around $100 is now being rolled out to other parts of the state. Uh, there's announcements being made in Geelong today. So we believe that having a strong budget delivers the opportunity for cost of living savings that we can particularly target to those who need the most and help our community get stronger. I also just want to highlight the decisions led by Mary Wooldridge with regard to the NDIS. I think that was one of the uh, proudest moments of my time in politics 
and as Premier that we were able to sign with the former uh, federal government an agreement between Victoria and the Commonwealth Government to roll out the NDIS across uh, Victoria with the initial launch site in Barwon but a commitment to roll it out across the state. There is no doubt the NDIS will make a real difference to the quality of life of people with disabilities right across Australia. And I think its time had come. It was absolutely essential, and we believe we uh, uh, did the right thing by signing up Victoria, and we're very proud to do so. On top of that, in Victoria, I think we've got a special bonus because the Victorian government uh, did a deal with the federal government to get the headquarters, the national headquarters of the NDIS or the NDIA here in Geelong in Victoria. And the reason I think that's really special is because not only does it provide 300 jobs for Geelong, which we found we're very pleased about, but the most important thing, the most important thing, with due respect to all the bureaucrats in Canberra, getting the bureaucrats who run the NDIS living in Geelong and working in Geelong and living in communities in Geelong, rubbing shoulders with uh, people who have disabilities, rubbing shoulders with ordinary families in Geelong, dealing with children with disabilities, dealing with uh, family members with disabilities, I think will give us better, more practical management of the NDIS for the many, many years to come. And we're seeking to do that throughout our processes. Mary Wooldridge is actively driving reform through the community services sector. And no reform is without some challenges, but it's driven by trying to get the best outcome for the people in our community. And understanding, understanding as Mary Wooldridge understands, that you can't deal with people with a multiplicity of problems and families with a multiplicity of problems with the old silo approach we've had in the past. We must take a more holistic approach. We must take a more uh, service-centred approach, looking after the needs of the individual, looking after the needs of the family. And that's what's driving the reform process, and Mary will have more to say about that this afternoon. I want to especially mention today the issue of family violence. This government is proud of its record of supporting vulnerable Victorians and working with uh, the victims of family violence and seeking to continue to improve our services for people who are affected by family violence and seeking to reduce family violence within our community. We're always prepared to listen and identify opportunities to improve our service system. And we know that family violence is a scourge on our society. We know that recent horrific cases have again highlighted across the community the issues of family violence. And while those cases are horrific and sad, they do focus the community's attention on the need to address family violence. It's not an issue that can be addressed by government. It's not an issue that can be addressed by well-caring and well-meaning organisations. It's an issue that needs to be addressed by the whole Victorian community. We need to genuinely stand up against family violence. We need to genuinely change attitudes we need to genuinely educate the community, and particularly men in the community, with respect to family violence. And I acknowledge the leadership of uh, Chief Commissioner Ken Lay and many others in the community who are very much publicly on the front foot against family violence. And you do need a holistic approach to deal with family violence. If we go back years and decades, what went on in the next door house, what went on in auntie and uncle's house was seen as their business and not our business. That is no longer acceptable. 
and we must be very clear about saying it's unacceptable and we must stamp out family violence. And we must also understand that family violence is assault. Assault. It is a criminal offence. We also need to understand that family violence is more than physical violence. It's psychological, emotional and financial, bullying, abuse and violence. And all of those things are unacceptable. All of those things need to be exposed to the light of public scrutiny and be said that it's unacceptable. Our government is certainly working on a holistic approach. We have increased significantly funding for specialist family violence services uh, up to $95 million a year in this year's budget. And indeed, in this year's budget, we provide another $23 million to expand the strengthening risk management projects for more sexual assault services and educating frontline workers on family violence. We also recommitted to the National Partnership on Housing and Homelessness, of which a significant amount of that money is for family violence services. And last Friday, I announced $3 million for the Annie North Refuge in Bendigo. And that particular refuge is an interesting model, which will be watched uh, not, across, not only across Victoria, but across Australia and the world, because it provides a cluster model of a refuge, which is not a hidden venue, but a known venue with supports for the families, links to the community and with proper protections. But we make no apology for taking a holistic approach on family violence. We know that it's not just about the specialist services, it's the linked up services, it's the education, it's about policing, it's about the justice system, and it's about, most importantly, education, as well as having support services for victims of family violence and their families. Indeed, in terms of the justice system, it's interesting to note, in May this year, Justices Neve and Kairou of the Court of Appeal said that the only way to protect family violence victims is to let abusers know they'll face lengthy jail terms. And indeed, this government has introduced tougher sentencing, introduced tougher parole and bail, and have abolished home detention. And it's also interesting to note that in yesterday's crime statistics that came out, that one of the biggest increases in the crime statistics was the implementation of justice offences. In other words, the increase in satire crime statistics was driven very much by police catching people who are breaching intervention orders, breaching parole, breaching bail. And that's a good thing. And we make no apology for having more police out there to do that. And we also welcome Ken Lay's decision in terms of having specialist family violence task forces, not just in Melbourne, but in regional centres and country police stations, so that we've now got 30 specialist family violence units across the state. And as The Age said in its editorial yesterday, these response units are, and I quote, a clever and important part of policing work. So these things are an important part of how we deal with family violence. But there's still more to be done. And today, I'm pleased to announce to build on that significant whole of government approach, we're able to announce an additional package of $30 million over the next four years. This is a package of practical programs that will make a real difference to a high risk family violence victims. The key aim of the package is to provide high-risk victims of family violence with timely and meaningful support. It will build on the $95 million that was already in the budget this year. And certainly, it will involve a number of distinct uh, areas of allocation of funding. Firstly, we will commit to a statewide rollout of strengthening risk management program. We announced in the budget that this program would move from two to ten areas. Today's commitment takes it to all 17 areas across the state will have strength management programs.
This initiative will greatly improve safety and longer term outcomes for higher risk family violence victims who re require support from multiple agencies. Risk, management, risk assessment management panels, or RAMPs, bring together police, courts, family violence and human services to provide a uniform and coordinated response. These RAMPs have been found to be highly successful in Geelong and Hume. A full-time coordinator in each area across the state will ensure that women and children in a high-risk situation will be carefully examined and managed and the perpetrators are appropriately monitored and held to account. Secondly, police reports or referrals for family violence that also involve children will be fast-tracked for an appropriate response, whether that be the statutory system, the family violence system or broader family services. We will design this new simplified approach with you over the next six months. Thirdly, a significant part of this funding will ensure that family violence and community services have strong case management capabilities that are equipped with practical arsenal that supports, uh, the high, supports uh, often high risk victims. A strong focus will be placed on counselling for children exposed to violence in an effort to prevent long-term profound damage. There is also targeted assistance for women and children who have experienced family violence to regain a normal life. For example, this will also provide flexible funding to create a path for women to find housing and a job, supporting them to uh, regain their independence and their dignity and sense of self-worth. Packages will be available of $1,500 to $7,000 per family to assist family with uh, practical matters such as changing schools, setting up a new home or paying a rental bond if that's required. It will also allow for the purchase of safety equipment through the Safe at Home program so that women and children don't have to uproot their current existence where violence occurs. So that may include improved locks, improved safety systems of the house, including CCTV cameras. This funding expands the capacity of family violence and family services to support women who utilise the ramps that I mentioned earlier, as well as many others. Finally, our family violence also includes uh, programs to reduce the risk of perpetrators uh, re-offending and changing their ways. And we know that perpetrator programs can and do work and we will continue to work with you and with the organisers of those programs to deliver those programs. Can I conclude by saying once again thank you all for the work you do across our community. You are the people who make a real difference to individuals, to families, to the community in which we live. We have a great community here in Victoria. We know there are challenges. We know there are issues that need to be addressed. And one of those key issues is the scourge of family violence. And what we want to do as a government is to work with you to identify practical, real opportunities to make a difference and to reduce the incidence and prevalence of family violence. The additional $30 million we're announcing today will continue that good work. We want to continue our dialogue, continue our liaison so that we can continue to look at further opportunities and further assistance to make sure we make this great state of Victoria an even better state. Thank you very much.